Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. Coming to you a little early for those of you who might be watching us live. We are recording on a Friday afternoon today. I wanted to start the episode off with a little bit of a fun fact that I learned. And as you're in this industry, things come up all the time. I learn new things all the time, even though I've been in the industry for a long time. And these are some basic facts. But I learned that the 127.0.0.0 loopback IP that we often use to talk back to the local host is actually designated as a slash eight in the RF, RFC. Which means that technically you can use 127.127.1.1 and that would also talk back to the local host. There was a proposal that was out there to try to change the slash eight to a slash 16 due to the IPv4 exhaustion, which... I think would cause a lot of problems because a lot of people actually use that within their networks or they hard code it. Fortinet actually hard codes and uses different IPs within that slash eight to talk internally to their devices. And if you're trying to route to that externally, I think a lot of those IPs would just get lost. And then as I was diving down this path of different IP addresses that were assigned, I learned that in the dawn of the internet era, companies were just getting slash eights. It was like Oprah, like you get a slash eight and you get a slash eight. <laughs> so like Apple get, had a slash eight or still has a slash eight. Uh, Ford has a slash eight. Um, Comcast has a slash eight. And just to give you an idea, if you don't know, it's 256 to the power of three number of IPs, which is roughly 16.7 million IPs. So, I don't think one single company needs 16.7 plus million IPs to be externally routable to their resources, their websites, whatever they're hosting. Um, and so there are, there are some companies that have been starting to turn back over their allocation. Stanford University was one of the most recent ones that actually turned over their slash eight back to the uh, the IP gods essentially to uh, help with the ipv4 exhaustion but i just thought i'd throw that out there in case um some people were like me and didn't know i did not know that's why i learned something today there you go let's learn something else all right so our main topic today is going to be talking about threat and vulnerability management we've often talked about this type of program on the show before but i thought i would do a little bit of more of a deep dive into how to run a program like this at your organization. Threat and vulnerability management is one of the key pillars to having a healthy security program. Oftentimes you're asked to report on different vulnerabilities when something comes out, like for example, a vulnerability like the exchange vulnerability or when the SMB vulnerability was uh, was uh, getting exploited with ransomware, we were asked to report on which one of our servers had that vulnerability and hadn't been patched yet. So you can run different reports through a vulnerability management scanner and print off different hosts that have that vulnerability and then target and make sure those are patched. And so that's oftentimes the, the overview of the program, but it takes a lot of care and feeding and coordination internally to make sure that the program is successful. When you're putting a program together, there's different phases of the program. The very first one is oftentimes where a lot of companies actually get tripped up. It should be the discovery phase. You want to know what your assets are. And by assets, I mean 
firewalls, IoT devices, endpoints, servers. You not only want to have them listed out, but you also want to have the owners of those. Oftentimes in companies, servers host different applications and the applications may run critical processes or systems for the company. If you're scanning them, they may have some performance issues. If you're patching them, they may need to be down for a certain period of time. So you want to work with the application owners, the server owners, to make sure that you're coordinating all of that so that there's little downtime for the company. And you want to make sure that you're prioritizing and kind of categorizing your assets. A web server for some little known internal app may not be as important as your domain controllers. So you want to have a list or a ring. Oftentimes we talk about that zero ring, the one ring and the two ring, zero being your domain controllers and any like business critical apps that if they were down, your company's not making money versus like two, which is like the outside your user endpoints that may not be as critical, but have that priority for your assets as you're doing the inventory. Once you have an inventory, that's where you start your scanning. There's a lot of different scanning tools out there. I'll just mention a few. I have experience with Nessus. I have experience with Qualys and Microsoft Defender as well and CrowdStrike at my previous company. Each product that's out there implements their scanning in a different method. Qualys and Nessus are very similar in the way that they run it. They're usually hosted on a server of some sort, and most of them will use either a credential or a non-credentialed scan. If you're using a non-credentialed scan, then that means they're just scanning against the host on the outside, and they'll look for open ports, maybe fingerprint based on different telemetry that's coming from the host to say, okay, this is a Linux server or this is a Mac host or this is a Windows server. And they can do that based on some of the telemetry that they're seeing and they can fingerprint it and then look for different things that are associated with it. If you're doing a credential scan, it's a little bit better. However, understand that you're giving usually privileged access to your systems with a credential. And more often than not, when you're implementing these things, you will go ahead and give a domain account, domain admin to do these scans, which is generally a terrible idea, but these things happen and there's project deadlines and you're just like, go ahead, I'm just going to give it domain admin. You know, you want to try to put in safeguards to that account, make sure that it can't sign on locally, other things, right? If you're, if that's the way that you're doing it, ideally you take the time to scope in the necessary permissions for that particular account. Then there's other ones that are like agent based. CrowdStrike is a good example where they're using their EDR agent to do a scan because the EDR agent has kernel level access to all the processes and then it can see all the th- different patch levels of that device. But if you can't install an agent on something like a firewall, then those solutions don't really work. You can do a credentialed scan using SSH credentials, like for a firewall, like using Qualys or Nessus. Again, same risks apply because you're storing yet another privileged credential. Microsoft Defender for Endpoint is kind of, different in the fact that it does have an agent-based vulnerability scanner built in with the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint service. It's built into Windows, so we call it agentless because you're not having to install another agent, which means that also you don't have to update the agent. Whenever there's different updates for the operating system, you don't have to worry about updating the agent itself. And then you can implement a network scanner now where you're actually hosting a network scanner on a server that is onboarded with Microsoft Defender for Endpoint and then 
entering in different IP addresses and targets for Palo Alto firewalls or Cisco firewalls. So it has that capability to look at network devices, even without an agent built in. You know, there's, there's a lot to unpack here, but one of the things that kind of stood out to me as I was just thinking about this, as you describe the different methods is, you know, some of our listeners, especially if you have less experience with this, your initial reaction might be, well, why wouldn't I always do a credentialed scan with a properly scoped, just enough access account? What's wrong with that? Nothing. However, you know, there's different types of pen testing. And one of the types of pen testing is when you give the pen testers nothing, you give them no information and they see what they can discover to break in your environment because that most closely resembles an adversary breaking into your environment because that's how they do it. And doing a non-credentialed scan and seeing kind of what public response or, you know, external response a box gives is valuable because again, that's how adversaries are going to try to break into that box. They're going to do scans and look for a, a fingerprint. First off, what kind of box is this? Is it Mac OS? Is it Windows? Is it Linux? What flavor of Linux? Uh, is it a, you know, OT device or whatever? And then they're going to look for, you know, known vulnerabilities to potentially break into said box. And so there is value in you scanning that same way because you're essentially getting out in front of the bad guys and trying to do the same things they do. So there is value in both of acting like an adversary in the sense of, I have no visibility into this box. What can I tell? You know, what can I learn from it? So I, I think that's interesting for both. And do you think you did a good job of summarizing, you know, more of the, the scanner based solutions like a, uh, a Nessus um, compared to more of the part of an EDR solution like Microsoft Defender for Endpoint and CrowdStrike? Uh, one thing I wanted to add just as a, a kind of point of interest here, if you are running workloads in Azure, or actually this can extend to, let me broaden this, any public cloud or even inside your own network, there is a cloud security posture management slash cloud workload protection solution. Uh, used to be called Azure Defender. It is now known today as Microsoft Defender for Cloud. And again, it, it can extend into those third-party clouds as well as on-premises. So it's not just an Azure thing. But one of the things included with that, if you do Microsoft Defender for servers, is it not only includes the EDR solution, but it also includes a TVM solution. You can use Qualys or Microsoft Defender for Endpoint as part of it. So that's something you may not be aware of, but it all rolls up into your Azure subscription. It's billed as Azure Consumed Revenue, the same way as anything else you do in Azure. And so that's a really effective way if you don't kind of have the wherewithal or desire or whatever the case may be to go through a whole procurement process of buying kind of one of these off the shelf solutions. If you want to do it more ad hoc as you onboard servers to your cloud or on-premises environment, doing that through Microsoft Defender for cloud is a way you can kind of do that as a, as a pay as you go subscription type model. Um, and, and that's really powerful, especially that you can pick Qualys or Defender for Endpoint and you, um, you don't even have to have a Qualys account or, or have any relationship with Qualys to do that. So that's kind of a cool way too. If you want to dip your toe into the TVM water here and, and start getting on board with that, that's a way you can do it as part of your existing kind of efforts. So just want to call that out as something kind of cool that not everybody knows. We always talk about ways to practice, like having your own lab. And Nessus has its own essentials tier of product, uh, similar to like a community edition, where it's free and you can download it and you can host it pretty much on any type of operating system. It has a Linux installer it has a windows server has a windows client installer mac os so you can host it on an actual your home pc if you wanted to or you can spin it up on a different pc or server a vm that has access to the different systems that you want to scan it's limited to 16 ips and in your scans you can designate the ip addresses or range or a subnet uh, to scan and then it'll do a discovery scan and once it does a discovery scan, you can select different hosts to do an actual scan. If you wanted to, you can actually enter in credentials and do a credentialed scan. So for example, in within my lab, I deployed 
the Nessus scanner on a server. And then I have a set of credentials that I entered in that has access to my other servers and it's doing a credentialed scan. So again, you know, risks versus likelihood, you want to try to weigh that out if you're deploying this in production and how you want to scope those permissions. But it is a good way to practice. If you have your own lab, go ahead and spin it up, put it on any type of machine that you have in that lab and try scanning and then see what the results are like. It's really interesting looking at the results because it'll have different type of actual configuration vulnerabilities. For example, by default, Windows servers allow SHA-1 hashing algorithms. And so one of the medium risk uh, vulnerabilities that popped up is that this server allows lower ciphers to be uh, to be used. And so uh, you can look at that and then look at ways to remediate that because that's not necessarily a patch. It's more of a configuration. So once you start configuring it, maybe you can develop a policy to then disable lower level ciphers. I'm really glad you called this out because we used Nessus in the lab as part of my certified ethical hacker uh material essentially got it got to poke around with it and it's something i'd never run into before i went through that program and it's a really really powerful you know respected tool and it is amazing you point it at an at a box and the recommendations and findings that will come back with you know what might be a good exercise to try to get a practice of a couple of things all together stand up like andy said say a windows server and you know do a scan then go apply, say, the security baselines from Microsoft that you know harden a lot of it automatically. You just apply the whole security baseline, and then try again and see what difference that makes. You know, and that highlights how threat and vulnerability management is not just patching. You know, that's part of it, but it's also configuration management. And if you apply a hardened configuration, your level of vulnerabilities is going to go down precipitously. And so that's a you know a potentially fun exercise that you can do with everything that's just you know, free off the shelf stuff. I mean, you can get a, you know, evaluation copy of windows server or anything else to, to poke at and, and try some of those things out with, or, or it could be windows client too, you know, same, same result really. So those are, I, I always love the call outs of ways, you know, for people who are trying to build their skills or, or break into the, the industry uh, ways you can do that inexpensively or at no cost to get hands on some of these tools. So love that call out. Once you have your scan and your report, you're going to get a list of these vulnerabilities, just like I did when I did my practice scan. And I had a few info level vulnerabilities or just, you know, items. I had a few low, I had a few medium and I had a few high. And so you're looking at these and you're going to want to prioritize which ones are important. Because again, some of them are configuration, like how much time do you want to spend on actual configuration and policy versus remediation, maybe it's a patch, right? And so you're going to want to prioritize which vulnerabilities you're going to address on the critical systems that you looked at in the first phase on your discovery and asset management. I usually focus on the critical ones or the high ones if you have just highs, but most of the time if you're scanning in your environment, if you're not patching which not everyone is doing, you're probably going to come along with some highs. The high ones usually are RCEs, like the remote controlled exploits, or the um, local privilege escalation ones. Those are typical ones that you want to look at. But usually RCEs are a little bit more pressing because those are ones that can be exploited over the internet. Whereas local privilege escalation, those are definitely critical, right? But they have to compromise your network first. So there's a little bit more of a um, path to get to those. Whereas the RCEs, you know, especially if you have them externally facing to the internet, those are going to be your most critical ones. You want to think about different attack paths like I'm, I'm t- talking about right now, right? So if, if your VPN gateway has a vulnerability that is an RCE, yeah, let's get that patched as soon as possible. The exchange one, that was a an RCE as well. It had 
the ability if you were hosting a, a site, a, a, the exchange sign in from a web page on a web server, it had the ability to get compromised and then from there compromise your exchange server. So you want to think about the ways that a an attacker can get to it. If it's a local privilege escalation, right? They have to compromise an identity. They have to compromise your network. Then they have to get to your host before you can actually escalate that privilege. So once you think about that, you'll have a good plan to prioritize the different types of vulnerabilities that are on your report. I think that's a really good point. You you know, just really putting more thought into it than just raw prioritization, but also it's positioning in your environment as far as how mission critical it is, or like you pointed out, Andy, you know, how external facing it is. And uh, all of those things need to be weighed into making your decisions on where you want to focus your efforts first. And so sometimes security teams, I think have a tendency to say the sky is falling. Um, and, and this is where really having a kind of process driven approach to how we evaluate our vulnerabilities and how we address them is really, really important. So, so one of the things you'll actually learn if you've ever uh, had the lovely task of reviewing like audit reports for a public cloud entity, like Andy and I as employer Microsoft, as an example, we publish, you know, how we do vulnerability scanning as part of some of our audit findings. And then, um, the schedule on which we, we issue those patches. And so what you'll discover is, you know, there's a vulnerability ranking system that is followed and the highest level vulnerabilities are patched, you know, within 24 hours or something like that. There's an SLA, but then the next ones are, you know, patched during regular, you know, scheduled maintenance or whatever. So, you know, past the ones that are like the sky really is falling kind of thing. Most of the rest of it falls into a a regularly scheduled process that's part of operationalizing the environment for public cloud and not saying that is the right or wrong answer for how you should approach it, but it's something to think about that it'd be really easy to run one of these. And especially if you have less experience with it, you know, lose your mind, start pulling your hair out, have your head explode. And in reality, outside of the super important ones, they are things you need to address in a timely fashion, but they're, they might not be things you need to address out of band. You might be able to handle those during your regularly scheduled maintenance and patching procedures. So just something to think about there too. Once you've prioritized all the vulnerabilities, now it's time to remediate them. And so now you're working again with the business because oftentimes security teams don't own the infrastructure. They may not even have access to a lot of these servers. If you're following true role-based access and uh, least priority or least privileged access. And so you want to work with these teams that are the server admins, that are the application admins to patch those servers or to remediate the configuration. And this takes time and care. At my previous company, my former uh, coworker, Nate Gardner, who was on our show, handled a weekly meeting with the infrastructure team where he would have a list of servers and have a list of vulnerabilities and they would go down the line and look at each server and say, okay, this one we talked about last week, it still isn't patched. Like what's going on with it. Right. And it's, it's that level of detail to try to make sure that the teams are actually patching. Because if, if you don't remind them, most likely it's not going to get done in my experience, at least. And so you want to make sure to continue to harp on these server admins and application admins to patch, um, you know, work with them obviously within the constraints of the business to make sure that they're doing it during downtime and it doesn't affect anything because they're not going to like you if they patch and something happens and it brings down the business and now they're on the hook for something. So, you know, Make sure that you aren't saying the sky is falling if the sky isn't actually falling, right? And prioritize the vulnerabilities that are important on the list in a timely fashion. So, um, and then of course, once you have those patches done, you can validate them. Validation may be just doing another scan, 
or it could be doing an external pen test. An external pen test is a great way to do a validation because um, it validates whether or not your attack paths that you talked that you thought about during your prior- prioritization are possible anymore. Oftentimes, the first thing an external pen tester will do is do a scan. Like Adam said, just like a an attacker, they're going to do a non-credential scan against all of your IPs, against all of your internal systems, whatever they can get their hands on, and then escalate from there. And if you're thinking about the attack paths and you're patching it, validation, you know, in the fact that an external pen tester says, yep, I did a scan and I couldn't find anything. That's great, right? And so that's po- probably the, the last step. And then, Again, this is this is something that someone should own at a company. You, you cannot just say, oh, we have a program if you're not actually doing it on a weekly, daily basis because you get those patches, but then someone still has to work on those, you know, medium, um, you know, high risk ones that may be configurations. So you got to work at those as well. So it's it's almost an FTE in larger companies, depending on how many assets you have, for sure it could be a, a part-time, like a 0.5 uh, FTE position, in my opinion. You know, talking about at your company, how literally you had a guy whose job was to go sit with the infrastructure team and run down a checklist. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? And that's one way to do it, right? Is is just pure accountability and, and human-driven accountability um, you can also look at ways where, where technology can maybe help. It is not going to be a silver bullet, but there are ways technology can assist. So one specific example I'm thinking of in my mind, and again, this doesn't solve for every use case, but it's something, is that if you're using Microsoft Defender for Endpoint to discover vulnerabilities through its TVM capability, there is a way to actually funnel those requests then to go fix something, whether that's patching or changing configuration and send it over to Microsoft endpoint manager, which might be run by a different team to actually make those changes in the endpoint management environment. So again, doesn't solve for every use case, but it's a thing. And you might build a workflow through something like ServiceNow to accomplish the same kind of thing where you, you, it, it automatically opens the change request and it automatically does this and that. And here's the work item and everything else. Like there's so many different ways you can solve for this. It might even be built in, you know, to be honest and like a service now at this point too. Um, but however you do it, you have a process to track all the way through remediation and then. I think, Andy, I love your your kind of tie up here, your denouement, that ultimately you go back at the beginning of the cycle to doing another pen test and you start over and see where you at now. And it's a cycle, you know, it's an it's a it's a loop where you keep going through it and checking and seeing, hey, what do we have now? Okay, let's go fix all that. Let's check again. And um, you know, this really becomes part of operational activity in your environment that never ends. And and so making sure that you are properly staffed to handle this and that you've accurately scoped the time investment involved. And this doesn't just get dumped on somebody else's plate. That's already pulling 40 hours a week. Really important call out Andy there, that this is probably at least a half FTE, if not more uh, to, to run a program like this. Cause that's, that's very, very, very true. So certainly it's part of your journey towards, you know, to borrow Maslow's hierarchy of needs again from psychology, like self-actualization of your security environment and your security posture. Um, but you need to make sure that you're, you're tooled up along the way, both in terms of people as well as technology to get to that, um, that end state where you're constantly scanning and remediating and scanning and remediating over and over again. I'm glad you mentioned technology because yes, the manual process is probably where you might start, but you want to try to automate this in the end, ideally, Patching in reality should just be an automated thing at this point. Unfortunately, there is a lot of companies that are still, you know, manually going into each server and updating it because there are consequences. Don't get me wrong. There are consequences to patching and maybe bringing down a service or something like that. So you do want to validate and maybe you prioritize those ones that you are are, that are business critical. You manually patch those, but the other ones should be automated. And so, Uh, Again, that asset inventory, the prioritization of your assets uh, plays a big deal into this. And then also glad that you mentioned that it's an iterative process, Adam, because 
TVM reports are a snapshot in time, but I think as security professionals, we fail if time and time again, we see the same vulnerabilities appear on those reports. A lot of times people will get a third party pen test because it's part of an audit. They're like, yep, we got one this year. Yep, we got one this year. But then when you look at each report year over year, yeah, we got in using these passwords. Guess what? Next year, got in using the same passwords, right? And so uh, a lot of times you're using the same company, the same guys doing the same thing. And he's like, yeah, I'll just try this thing that I did last year. Oh, guess what? It still works. Um, so again, there's, there's some value in changing pen testing vendors because... They don't know your environment, but also, again, it's a snapshot in time. You want to try to make incremental change on those reports, and it's not just the same thing over and over again. Otherwise, why are we doing this, right? So hopefully this gives you an idea of what a framework can be for a threat and vulnerability management program. It is a critical pillar of your security program, in my opinion, Obviously, you want to have some of your EDR and, and email, secure email gateway, that sort of stuff stood up first. But I think having this, it's often required for a lot of audits uh, for compliance, but also it's great to have insight to know what your vulnerabilities are and then continue to work at that because it'll be overwhelming, but it, take small steps, try to make incremental improvement. One policy improvement is still an improvement one server patched is still an improvement. So make incremental change and try to get to that point where you understand what your vulnerabilities are and you're comfortable with accepting some risk with your exposed vulnerabilities because you're not going to get to zero. It's just never going to happen, right? But get to the point where you're comfortable accepting the risk and work, working towards reducing that. Andy, before we go, one last thought on that note, and I, I want to pick your brain on this. You talked about that iterative improvement and, you know, making improvement over time, showing progress is a really good thing. That is a desirable goal. So one of the things you talked about at the top of the show was around asset inventory and having that asset inventory to be used to determine risk, uh, to determine mission criticality, all of those things. I, I can tell you from experience that there are plenty of IT shops that sadly do not have a solid asset inventory. And, you know, unless they get some really strong leadership in there that demands it, might not have it anytime soon. Do you have any thoughts around how that might affect some of our conversation from today? As far as if, if you know, you were listening along, you're like, I'm, I'm with you guys, I'm, I'm with you, but gosh, we don't, we don't really have that level of understanding of what all we have out there. Can I not move forward with this? And, you know, kind of your thoughts on that. Yeah, when you do a discovery scan and for the you know Nessus, Qualys, you can do discovery scans. You can do that with MDE as well, the Defender for Endpoint. You can get a list of all the different IPs and maybe host names associated with them to see what's out there. Ideally, to me, I, I worked at a company where we had a really, really good IPAM solution. So IP asset management solution, where when you're assigning static IPs to a server, which is generally the best practice, right? You don't want to have dynamically assigned IP addresses for servers in an environment. So you're dynamically, your static assignments for IPs are then listed in an IPAM solution, so ideally, every server that you spin up, right, every server that you spin up will then have to go to the network team to get an IP assigned within the designated subnet, and they'll record that in their IPAM solution. That could be a great starting point for your asset inventory. And you can put notes in there and, and whatnot as well for who owns it, what application it's running. Um, but that's that's a great way to start. If not, you can always just start, you know, very rudimentary with a printout of IPs and a spreadsheet and go from there. Highly recommend, though, that you get an IPAM solution. Endpoints are not as critical in this aspect because, I mean, endpoints are, are going to get patched, you know, um, for the most part, as long as you're doing your endpoint management patching. Servers is really, when it comes to threat and vulnerability, servers and firewalls are probably going to be your most critical ones that you're looking at in this program. So 
IPAM solutions to me is critical in managing your assets in that aspect. Or, you know, again, there's other different methods of doing asset inventory, like solar winds or something like that, where you're doing um, uh, performance uh, as far as uh, tracking uh, CPU usage and memory, you know, those type of solutions maybe also have asset inventory built in. So there's a lot of different vendors and solutions out there to do something like that. To me, it makes sense to have an IPAM solution to do this because if I give you an IP address, which oftentimes happens when you get an alert, like, and maybe the DNS doesn't resolve, I'm going to want to know what host it's on. Mm -hmm. Ideally, I have access to an IPAM solution to look that up right away. So my takeaway from kind of what you just shared is you probably have more asset inventory defined in some way in different systems than you may already know about. So it, it might be a matter of stitching some of that information together to get a more holistic picture, but you probably have enough to move forward actually. And if not, you can move forward anyway. And, you know, you might just have to do a little more intelligence gathering at the time of remediation to be like, Hey, before we go patch this server, is this kind of important? What's this, what does it do? You know, you could do it at that time if you have to, but it sure heck is a lot easier to know that up front. It's always fun to get those initial reports too, because you'll get a server that's on there and it's some server that hasn't been patched in two years. And then you'll ask like, what is this server? <laughs> and then the server management team will be like, oh yeah, we could probably stand that down. Mm -hmm. Great. One less thing to worry about, right? Don't even worry about patching it, just decommission it. So that's always a fun exercise again with the discovery because you'll, you're going to find things. If it has an IP address, if it's on your network, you're going to find it. And then you're going to, you're going to be like, well, this thing has a hundred vulnerabilities. Are we going to patch this thing? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to decommission it? So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there are assets that you have that people have no idea that they're still out there. Right. And, uh, and this is a great way to, to figure that out. So that's our episode for this week. Thanks for listening. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics that you want us to talk about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.